All right, let's get started and talk about recommender systems, guys. So um, let me give you a little bit more about my bio and we'll open it up for questions. And if there's no questions from uh, the audience here, I have some frequently asked questions that I can go through as well that I'm prepared to talk about. And uh, we can also go through some code and actually uh, see a real working recommender system in action. So we've got plenty of material to fill up this time, I think. Uh, but yeah, just to tell you a little bit about me first, let's talk about me. Uh, my name is Frank Kane again. I am uh, the president of Sundog Education. And uh, these days I earn a living by making online video courses on platforms such as Manning. Um, before that, though, I spent nine years working at Amazon.com. Started there in 2003 as a senior engineer, software engineer. And when I started there, they threw me into what they call the personalization team. This was the guys that were doing personalized recommendations, people who bought also bought. And back then, they didn't really call them recommender systems. You know, it, it wasn't really a thing yet. It's just, it was just algorithms. It was uh, programming more than anything, you know? So we were kind of like blending these fields of, uh, you know, data science, although it wasn't really called data science back then, uh, software engineering and system engineering at very large scale and distributed systems to try to compute these recommendations for our customers, um, at least on a daily basis, and serve that in real time, you know, to thousands and thousands of transactions per second. It was an exciting place. And kind of learned by getting thrown into the into the deep end of the pool there, you know, but, um, you know, I, I managed to swim, thankfully, and uh, work my way up to senior manager by the time I left there. Um, by the time I was done with my career at Amazon, I was actually running the engineering team for imdb.com, which is a big movie website that's a subsidiary of Amazon. Lots of fun there. Like it's, it's just as fun as it sounds. <laughs> um, but after nine years, um, my family just couldn't take the weather in Seattle anymore. So we packed up, cashed out, and moved to Florida. That's where we are now, and I've been working for myself ever since, uh, making courses for you. So that's my expertise in recommender systems. Um, I didn't just do recommender systems at Amazon, but it really was the focus of what I did for most of that time. So between recommender systems and content optimization and you know larger scale system en engineering work, uh, but personalization was always what it seemed to come back to for me. Even at IMDb, we had a movie recommender system, and You'll see the uh, the DNA of that experience in my course here because we lean heavily on making movie recommendations in this course about recommender systems because there's some really fun data sets out there to play with on that. Hey, we've got a question and it sounds like a hard one. <laughs> How can you determine the minimal size of previous information needed for a recommender system to be effective? Does it vary by application or platform? Yes, it varies It varies very widely. There's no real set answer to that. You kind of have to experiment with it, to be honest. Uh, there's no There's no formula. Because it depends a lot on the sparsity of that data, right? It's not just the quantity, it's how sparse it is. And that's what's different about recommender systems. Um, it's not like normal machine learning where you have a complete set of training data. Like, for example, if you're trying to train a system how to identify a picture of a cat, right? You throw a ton of pictures of cats at it that have, you know, every pixel in the image filled in. And you can train this neural network to figure out what a cat looks like, right? Uh, with recommendations, it doesn't work that way. Um, because a typical person, let's say you're recommending movies. Let's stick with that example. The typical person has not seen every movie in the world, right? I don't think anybody has. Well, I know one guy who has, my old boss at IMDb, Carl Needham. He's, I think he's actually seen every movie. But for, for normal people like you and me, uh, by and large, we've seen a very tiny, teeny, teeny percentage of all the movies in the world, right? Same idea holds true for Amazon. Like you have not bought every item on Amazon. Um, that is actually impossible. You've only bought a small amount of them, or you've even viewed a small amount of them. So this is what we call a sparse data problem. So the amount of information you need depends not only on the quantity of your data, but also on how sparse that data is. So, you know, if I have, you know, 5 million data points that people have bought the same three items, but I don't have any data points for like the other 10 million items in your catalog, uh, that's not going to be helpful, right? So it's this balance between quantity of data the sparsity of the data, and also the quality of the data as well. That plays a big role too. Um, give you an example of that. The best recommendations you will ever see are based on purchase information. And this is really the secret of why Amazon's recommendations have always been so good, because they can use data about what people are actually spending their money on to power and train those algorithms that they have. And there is no bigger reliable signal of interest than someone shelling out their cash and saying, I want to spend my money on this thing, right? Uh, that's a very hard thing to game. Uh, it's a very hard thing to fake. Um, very, very high quality data, right? So if you have a lot of purchase data and it's not sparsely distributed, that is the ideal situation. And that's the situation that Amazon is in, you know? So a big part of why their recommendations are so good is just because their data is so good. In contrast, if you have click-based data, 
uh, that can be very sketchy, right? Um, if someone's clicking on something on your website or viewing something on a website, you don't even know if that was a person looking at it. It, it was more likely a bot of some sort or a web crawler or something like that. And just cleaning that data and making sure that data is actually human beings expressing real interest in something um, can be a real problem. Even in the world of purchases, you know, there are data quality issues to be uh, contended with. Uh, a good example is institutional buyers. So you get these people that are buying things for their company or for their institution, and they're just buying things en masse for this like huge organization of thousands of people. And to your systems, this looks like one person buying like everything on the planet. <laughs> and that person ends up carrying an inordinate amount of weight in your algorithms as a result. And it, it doesn't really have any meaning to it because you're not really getting information about an individual's interest. You're getting information about this organization's interests. So yeah, it's a very long answer to your question. Uh, gosh, I, I'm not sure how to pronounce your handle there. Uh, but you know what I mean, right? There, the answer is no. That's a short answer. There is no no formula. There's no... Um, there's no set way to figure it out. You just have to experiment, quite honestly. Um, the way that you really approach developing recommender systems is to uh, just try different things and run A-B tests on it. Um, yeah, let's talk about that. So how do, how do I evaluate a recommender system? That's a huge portion of this course, actually, because it's not at all obvious. Uh, there's a lot of ways to do it. So a lot of people in the research community want to evaluate the quality of their recommendations offline, right? Because they're in research. They're not actually going to be deploying this to a real world system. So they can't test it out on real people. Uh, so what do you do? Well, one thing you can do is uh, measure the accuracy of the recommendations. And you can do that by saying, okay, I predicted that this person would rate this thing four stars. In reality, I know they rated it three stars, you know, therefore my accuracy is, you know, one out of five off, right? Um, but that's kind of a sketchy way to evaluate things because the purpose of a recommender system is not to predict what you would have rated something you already saw. You're trying to get new things in front of people that they haven't seen before, or maybe they have seen it, but they didn't know they wanted it yet, right? So really the purpose of a recommender system is to show people things that they didn't even know they wanted yet, you know, to, to read their minds, if you will. And that's why it's such a cool field. Uh, and that's a very hard thing to measure without getting real people in the loop. So in practice, when I'm developing a, a recommender system and I want to know if it's good or not, the first thing I'm going to do, and we're going to do this when I go through the code walkthrough, is try it out on myself. You know, I, I'll throw my own personal data at it, see what recommendations it gives it back to me, and I'll say, well, does that make sense? Does that actually reflect my interests, or is it a bunch of random crap that um, is irrelevant to me? You know, and uh, that's kind of the first line of defense on figuring out subjectively if I have a good algorithm or not, or if I have enough data or the quality of my data is sufficient, right? The next step would be to try it on some other people, you know, get some friends, you know, get some of your office mates to say, hey, try try this recommender system, see what the results are like for you. Do you think they're good? Do you think they're bad? Just get some qualitative feedback. I mean, the quantitative accuracy metrics are good and all, but you, they're just a very rough guide. You know, you have to get it in front of people to really evaluate it. And the ultimate test is going to be getting it out there in a live production setting in, an, in a controlled experiment in some sort of an A-B test, right? So if you have an existing recommender algorithm and you want to try a new one, you know, you, you try the new one at 10% and you measure its results, make sure that it's not, you know, doing something terrible to your revenue. And if it looks positive or at least even ramp up that uh, percentage over time of how much the new algorithm is getting exposed. And eventually you'll have enough data collected to actually know for sure if your algorithm is better or not. Yeah, again, great question uh, with a really long answer and not a very satisfying one, I'm afraid. Um, it, it is a hard problem to know, do I have good enough data? Do I have enough data? And uh, is my algorithm good enough? Uh, this is really the this is really what makes recommender systems hard and interesting, in my opinion. But um, I do have some frequently asked questions here. Um, if, I'm, if I'm honest, the most frequently asked question I get is, can I get your course for free? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, the other question I get is, um, will you do my homework for me? Again, the answer is no. So we got those out of the way. Um, <laughs> uh, but the, after that, um, there, I get good questions on this course, by and large. Um, one of the ones I get is, what are the prere prerequisites? Prerequisites, that's a hard thing to say uh, for getting into recommender systems. A lot of people, you know, they'll stumble across this course. They'll say, oh, that's cool. I can read people's minds with computers. Uh, I want to learn that. But you do need some background before tackling this stuff. Recommender systems is really a specialized subset of machine learning that deals with sparse data like we were talking about. And um, as such, it helps to have a background in machine learning first. And before you have a background in machine learning, it helps to have a background in Python and linear algebra, right? So you want to make sure you're coming into this with at least some computer science experiment experience 
at least some mathematical experience. Like we're talking high school level uh, math here, nothing too fancy. Uh, but you need to know what you know how trigonometry works at least. You know one of the common metrics that we use for how similar things are is the cosine metric. So at least know what a cosine is, guys. At least know what multiple dimensions are. You know these are important concepts for recommender systems. Um, so if you have that under your belt, you're in a good sh good starting point. Um, if you do have some CS, some programming experience, uh, you can probably take this course successfully. It would be even better though if you had some of the basics of machine learning under your belt first. And I do offer a more general machine learning and data science course also available on Manning Live Video. Probably a good place to start if you haven't uh, dipped your feet into the machine learning waters quite yet. Um, and yeah, uh, Python programming, obviously a good thing to have. Um, I do include sort of a, um, a primer in Python. So if you do have a, an existing programming experience and you think you can pick up Python pretty quickly, I'll help you do that in this course. But obviously if you know Python ahead of time, that also helps as well. But beyond that, um, I try to keep my courses as accessible as possible to people. I know they go out to a very wide audience with a very wide, uh, diverse range of experiences. So I want to make sure people feel successful in them, right? So I, I try not to dive in too deep into, uh, you know, hardcore algorithms and fancy mathematical notation. I try to explain things in, in human terms as much as possible. You know, if you look at like, you know, my courses and their reach around the world, um, I've had over 500,000 people take my courses around the world. And it is mind boggling the, the impact that that's having. It's uh, it, it's really a humbling thing. If you picture like, you know, the biggest football stadium in the world couldn't handle, it could not hold all of those students. So the, the power of online education is just really amazing. And, um, you know, more and more people are discovering that now that we're stuck at home. So it, it's good that we kind of like know how to do this now. We can actually share knowledge this way. Uh, can you rec Mr. Code2K, can you recommend large public data sources that are available online to play around with or yeah. Um, the UCI data repository, if you Google that, is a great source for uh, free um, open source data repositories. The really big ones, if you go to AWS, um, I don't have the link offhand, but if you search for it, I'm sure you can find it. Uh, they have a ton of public data sets available there that are just hosted on AWS, you know, within S3. And if you're actually, you know, doing your machine learning on, on an AWS fleet of servers on EC2 or SageMaker or what have you, um, it's very easy to access and pull in those large data sets that are hosted on AWS. So if you just search for AWS data sets, um, that'll bring you to it as well. Um, what I use in the course is the movie lens data set. Let's talk about that. Let's go there. This is a, a good segue to that. So if we go to uh, grouplens.org, this is kind of my favorite data set. And they have a wide range of sizes for you to play with. So a good technique when you're developing uh, machine learning algorithms or recommender systems is to start with a small data set and work your way up to larger data sets. That way you can experiment on your own local PC or a single host in the cloud. And, uh, you know, don't start to invest in like, you know, more and more of a, a larger cluster until you're confident that you're ready to do so. So if you go to data sets here, uh, this takes you to the group lens data set. These are, uh, this is called the movie lens data set. And what it is, is a repository of movie ratings that people have made. Uh, I can show you what that looks like. If we go to uh, movielens.org, it's kind of like Netflix. You know, they show you a bunch of movies and ask you to rate them, or at least how Netflix used to work. They don't actually do ratings anymore at Netflix, do they? But back in the day, this is how Netflix worked. So they show you people a bunch of movies and they ask them to rate them between one to five stars. And they've done this to actually thousands and thousands and thousands of people over the years. And they have actual real data on movie ratings that you can play with. So um, one of my favorite move, one of my favorite data sets, just because it's fun and because I like movies. I worked at IMDb, what can I say? Uh, but it's also easy to understand the results intuitively, right? So if you like put in your own set of data of what movies you've rated and what movies you've enjoyed, getting back predictions of what movies it thinks you might like that you haven't seen yet, uh, it makes it real. You know, it's very easy to understand that and, and interpret those results. But anyway, you can see they have a large set of uh, data sets here to choose from. They have a 25 million row data set here for when you want to scale things up. And if you want to start small, this is what we do in the course to get started. There's a small 100,000 rating data set. Obviously, you're not going to get as good recommendations from a small data set as a big one necessarily. And also, um, these are a little bit out of date, these older data sets. Uh, this one was last updated in 2018. So if you want data about the latest Hollywood blockbusters, you're not going to find it reflected in this data. But it's recent enough that you'll still recognize the movies that are in it. So a um, lot of fun uh, working with that data set. And we're going to do that shortly. Uh, let me go back to the, the Twitch stream here and see what other questions we might have. Oh, gosh, you guys are asking all sorts of stuff. This is great. Uh, oh, Avna Bolsi, you went there. How can you start applying for jobs to recommender systems? What is the number of projects needed before applying? 
yeah, this is actually uh, my next frequently asked question. You read my mind and uh, you just added one to that frequency of that question. So yeah, getting a job, getting a career. That's what we're all here for, right? So um, when I was at Amazon, I was what they called a bar raiser. And a big part of my job was hiring people and interviewing people. Um, I actually had the role of having veto authority for new hires all across the entire company, not just in my own team. So um, I was sort of like this Uber hiring manager, if you will. I literally interviewed thousands of people while I was at Amazon and hired hundreds of them. So I know a thing or two about getting a job in this field. So first of all, let me uh, make it clear. Taking an online course is the beginning of your journey. You are not going to get a job just because you took an online course. You're not going to get a job because you got a certification, at least not in the United States, uh, by and large. Uh, you need to show that you can apply what you've learned and actually build something with it. So your question is actually very well thought out. You're, you're asking, how many projects do I need? Um, and yeah, you're, 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 your head's in the right place, you know? So if I think about the recruiters and the hiring managers at companies like Amazon, and mind you, different companies, different countries are going to have different cultures and different standards, but I'm just talking from my own experience here. Um, they're going to be looking for either someone who, you know, just graduated from a college that they know and trust. You know, if, the, if you graduate from Stanford, you're going to get job offers. It's, uh, that's just how it works. Um, or if you're from a, you know, not so well-known university, they want to see that you've applied what you've learned at least. So one thing they'll actually do is uh, go out to like GitHub and like look at uh, places like Kaggle for people who are winning coding challenges. And if they find someone who's like, you know, new to the field, but is really showing a lot of promise in what they're accomplishing uh, online, you know, they might get a call. And that's another tip too, by the way. Um, these companies, don't call them, they call you. You know, if you apply to these companies, they get so many applications, they don't even look at them. Um, we literally did not look at them. They, you want them to find you and to make yourself discoverable, you have to be out there online. You need to be contributing to open source projects. You need to be, uh, you know, doing stuff like Kaggle challenges. You need to be contributing to um, whatever you can, uh, publishing your work, you know, uh, just make sure that the work you're doing is, you know, A, interesting and B, discoverable. Uh, brag about it on your LinkedIn profile. Make sure they can find you on LinkedIn. Uh, whatever it takes, just make sure you have an online presence that makes it really easy for someone to find you if they're looking for someone who is dabbling in recommender systems because that's the beauty about this field. It is like the most important field of AI and machine learning out there and people don't even realize it. I mean, this is, I can't tell you how much of Amazon's money comes from recommender systems, but it's a lot. And the same is true of places like YouTube and Netflix, right? Um, Google, right? These, these are the biggest employers and the biggest drivers of the global economy and recommender systems are central to what they do. And most people don't even know what recommender systems are, which is my next frequently asked question. What the heck is a recommender system? We'll, we'll go there too. So yeah, you know, just having some set of a body of work that you can put out there on the internet uh, related to recommender systems is going to be important. Uh, for example, when I was developing this course, I needed to find a framework to work within for the course. And I came across this thing called uh, an open source project called uh, Surprise Lib, uh, developed by a guy named uh, Nicholas Hug, I think it is. And if I was a hiring manager, I would give this guy a call. I'm like, hey, you've demonstrated that you understand how recommender systems work. You've demonstrated that you can write good code that is actually functional. Um, it's well-structured. Um, you know, I want you on my team, right? So uh, it, it doesn't have to be a lot of projects. It just has to be the right project, you know, one that really demonstrates proficiency. 